Good morning. It's 11 o'clock, and we would like to get started. If any of you are here for Wither Ideological Diversity, that has been changed to right across the hallway. They've asked me to announce that. So hopefully you are here. Oh, we're losing one. Hopefully we'll gain a few as well as we go along. We're losing two. We're losing three. But we're gaining one. All right. Ah. So, a net loss of two so far. <laughs> we'll see if we can't move that up. <gasps> All right, we're only down one. Well, anyway, good morning. Welcome to the Vice President's panel on Five Years Out, Past Presidents Reflect and Respond. As most of you are probably aware, 40 years ago today, Sesame Street debuted. <laughs> And if you're familiar with Sesame Street, you know the song, One of These Things Isn't Like the Other. And you're probably wondering, what am I doing here? My name is Clark Olson from Arizona State University, and I'm the only panelist who has never been or will be an NCA president. But I am the planner of the Five Years Out programs. And so what I would like to do is to tell you a little bit about what Five Years Out are truly intended to do. When Dawn came up with this idea for her convention, uh, she was thinking, and Dawn always thinking ahead, is thinking ahead five years from now to 2014 when our association will celebrate its 100th anniversary. And we thought, what better way to kick off a series of 42 panels, and you'll see them all in your convention program, noted by, um, I think they're fireworks that you see. So there are 42 opportunities that you have to see what this discipline is going to be like five years out. But we are going to try to unlock a real brain trust today of six past <laughs> NCA presidents throughout about the last four decades and see if they can't uh, tell us a little bit about what NCA was like and speculate as they re respond and reflect as to what NCA is going to be like five years from now. So we want them to talk about their accomplishments. We want them to talk about where they think this organization is headed. And uh, here to ask a few pertinent questions is the current NCA president, who probably has her pulse right on what's going on with NCA at the moment, from uh, the University of Montana, is Betsy Bach. I just took my pulse. I don't have one. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I am delighted to introduce our esteemed group of NCA former presidents, and let me do so, and then we will toss out the questions uh, that they will answer for us. And to my far left first is former President Michael Osborne, who's at the University of Memphis, and then progressing down the line, we have Samuel Becker, formerly from the University of Iowa. Jim Chesbro from Ball State University. Isa Engelberg from Prince George's Community College. David Zarefsky from Northwestern University. And finally, Anita Taylor from George Mason University. And as Clark and Dawn and I, to some extent, were planning this panel, um, Clark came up with a series of questions that he and Don thought would be a great idea to ask these former presidents, some of whom I know have prepared comments, others of whom who are just going to, shall we say, wing it. <laughs> and with that in mind, let me just ask all the questions so you all know what they are, and then people can choose to answer as they see fit. Are you all comfortable with that? Sure. All right. <laughs> well, why don't we just ask them one by one? First off, what have been the biggest changes in NCA since you became a member? Who would like to buzz in and answer first? Take a shot at it. Please. <laughs> Biggest changes, I, I would mention um, uh, two, I, I, you know, from my first uh, convention, which I guess was in the early 60s, wasn't it, Susie? I believe it was. 
And I would say that uh, a, a, a great fragmentation of interests, uh, in the, it's, a, it's much broader, more diverse place uh, in almost every way that I can think. Yeah. So I think that's one big change. And then another, I believe, is um, a, a shift of emphasis away from what, what I would call the rhetorical and humanistic, more towards the uh, professional and social scientific orientation. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't say that in any celebratory sense, but merely as, a, as an observer. I think those are two things I would say. Please, just jump in. I'm, I'm waiting for Sam because he's a person who has been here longer than I have and maybe the only other one besides Mike who has been here longer than I have. So I think I want to hear what Sam has to say and then I've got plenty to say about what this place was like. Okay. In other words, she's saying I'm the oldest uh, of all this group. Uh, I feel almost older than God. Um, <laughs> It seems to me the um, major change I see, in, in addition um, to those just mentioned, is that the scholarship in this organization has, has become more and more sophisticated. Um, young people, I find, are just doing fantastic work, and all one needs to do is go around to the various meetings and... Um, Listen, listen to some of the papers. Uh, they're just tremendous. And uh, it seems to me it uh, bodes well for our field uh, to see the quality of work that uh, people are doing today. When I first started coming uh, to the uh, NCA, uh, which was what I think uh, was then the Speech Association of America. Wow. That um, much of the work being reported was pretty naive, unsophisticated, and, uh, and that's no longer true. Uh, yeah, and there's been that, it seems to me, uh, the emphasis... Uh, on speech as such and uh, and much greater focus on other forms of, of communication uh, the construction of meanings mm -hmm. so that's the uh, that's the biggest can I um, let me respond because I was president when we switched over from Speech Communication Association to National Communication Association, and I fully admit I was involved in that name change, right? Um, and I thought it reflected the fact that our discipline really had changed from studying speech as an object to a much broader range of societal media systems and all of that. So I don't regret that part. I do regret, though, what Michael's talking about in the sense that we proliferate, proliferate uh, we created diverse systems <laughs> um, that are just overwhelming. Uh, when you look at the, our legislative assembly now, over 200 different representatives well, I think it really sought to have more and more people uh, participate in the process. I think what it's really done is made that assembly impossible to function as a deciding agency and place more and more power in the officers, and they are really deciding more and more for us. In that regard, I think the quest to unify and represent more people in one group really diminished our ultimate power. And that's what I would say that diversity thing comes means. Uh, for me, then, five years out, I would like to see us try to deal with that a little more directly and try to argue more for... I love uh, some of the, the concept of community of scholars, 
But I would even like to see NCA deal with the fact that it's isolated so many different groups and find some cohesion here. Maybe even a better branding system since we're a bigger group and we can be more PR oriented. But really move towards community of scholars as a way to try to handle the diversity, the division, the lack of cohesion that I really think exists here. And I think it would change too in my view, how the officers would start to think about their job in terms of the membership. Democracy is a messy process. Uh, I want to address specifically the question that Betsy posed. What was this place like when I first entered? And I'm going to talk not from a disciplinary point of view, but from the point of view of this organization. And some of you might be able to remember, and certainly Sam and Mike can, and maybe some others here at the table also. If you were looking for a job and you wanted to use the NCA placement service, you applied to a number. And you had no idea, except so far as a region of the country, where that college or institution was. It probably didn't matter because if you were looking for a job, the way to get it was through your uh, contacts, which at that time were, in fact, an old boy network. Although there were some young boys in it as well. And maybe some young, old boys who acted like young boys. But the placement service was simply a reflection of this organization. There were women in the organization, but you wouldn't know it, really, by looking beyond a few stars. There were stars, but you would not know that probably at least 30% of the members of the SAA or SCA, depending on when you came in, were women, because they didn't appear on convention programs except in very few numbers. They did not appear in the leadership except occasionally, maybe once every 10 years. And um, there were other ways that women's faces were not visible. Women were not the only invisible souls in the organization. People of color were here, largely invisible, until they started making their uh, presence known. And it's quite appropriate that Mel Cummings walks in at this precise moment because she was in that group that began to make the presence known of our African-American colleagues and the women in the organization who formed the Women's Caucus learned the many, many, many lessons from the Black Caucus. The face of the organization has changed tremendously. And that is because of, uh, and, and, and that is not unrelated, is what I mean to say. It is not unrelated to the growth in diversity, not only of the people who are here, but of the interests that we attend to, and the, uh, I, I'm sorry, Jim, not that I have ever disagreed with you before, <laughs> uh, and probably never will again, but there certainly was a tight control by the officers in the decisions that were made. And the Legislative Assembly, while smaller, was not particularly much more effective than it was now until 1977 came along and it sort of held an insurrection and decided that it would reflect the uh, demands of some of the people in the group. Um, I won't go on. I could, sp I could spend the day telling you what this place used to be like. But uh, you did ask the question, Betsy. I would agree with many of the comments that have, have been made already. I think the most notable changes since I joined were two changes of name that have already been alluded to, uh, each of which reflected a sense that the scope of the association had broadened and its, and its mission had broadened. A move of the national office from New York to Washington, which was intended to have much greater effect than it did, at least for a long time, and the a change in the size and scale of the organization. 
Uh, and I guess the way I would put it is our, our membership has grown and in the process of growing has become much more diverse, but our internal structure has proliferated at a far greater rate than our membership has grown. Uh, so the, the most obvious uh, change that is, is noticeable uh, is in the size of the convention, uh, particularly the number of programs and sessions in the convention. The convention program used to be a small booklet. Uh, there were four time slots per day, about ten sessions per time slot. Uh, the divisions had about four or five time slots apiece. There were far fewer uh, yeah. divisions. Uh, this is a change that has produced both costs and benefits, and I, I suspect as we, as we go on with the, with the uh, discussion, we'll uncover some of each. We've also grown significantly in the number of journals we publish. Uh, the quality of those journals has probably also increased, although that's harder, uh, that's harder to measure. And there have been shifting patterns in what motivates the formation of units within our structure, whether they are subject matter domains, places of employment, topical interests, demographic categories, and we now attempt to reflect all of those. Um, as the most recently born old past president, um, I've been listening to my colleagues, my good friends, and much of what I was going to say they've already mentioned, but I would just like to add three small changes that perhaps have not been mentioned yet. Well, they haven't been mentioned. One is that when I became a member of NCA in the very early 70s, there was no way that someone like me could ever have become president. Mm -hmm. Female, East Coast, and from a community college. There was, there was no recognition of that entity, let alone the thought that someone from there could actually move to a point of becoming and be elected by the body as president. I think that's a huge change in recognizing the kind of diversity that, and, uh, that has occurred. The second, I, I would ask you to, to note the wardrobe change um, in the last 40 years. Uh, the women wore dresses and uh, suits. Many still do, but Anita and I are both wearing purple, and I think that's a significant uh, change. And those of you who understand, right? <laughs> it's also a Kansas State color. Um, but one change that, that I think has become more obvious in the last few years is that many of the NCA presidents had debate and forensics backgrounds. And I think that was not a fluke. I think it had something to do with the notion of being able to um, coach, uh, look ahead, mentor, be well organized, be able to argue coherently, sometimes not, but at least sound as though we were. And um, that in the last few years has not been the case. And I, I, I guess one of my concerns is that that heritage is not as strong as it was. Uh, the status of forensics has been separate organizations who affiliate and come to this convention under the umbrella of the association, as do others, like ILA. Uh, like, uh, well, Rhetorical Society of America, like some of the linguistic groups, like the religious communication groups. And it is almost as though we, all we are is a place rather than a home for these groups. And I think that's been a significant change. Can I add one little comment here? Of course. Because I want to recall one thing that Isa just mentioned, and there's an another dimension here. But I remember distinctly the first time I was on the executive committee, all right? I came in as chairing the pub board. And at the point that year I came in, it was all males, all white males, right? But there was another little uh, difference there. They used to tell jokes. And I sat there very uh, quietly listening to these jokes which I personally found very offensive. And this is really awkward. The first time you're on executive committee, when you say to the entire assembled group of white males, I would appreciate if you just not tell those jokes while we are in a committee meeting. Later at the bar, I fully understand, but not now. Do you know how 
brave and strong I had to be to get those <laughs> words out. It scared the hell out of me to say that. And those kind of moments mm-hmm, mm-hmm. really occurred as we started changing the diversity of the association. Great. Thank you all. We'll move on to the, the next question, and this is a two-parter. What are the major contributions you think NCA has made in the past 40 years? And then as an addendum to that, what was your biggest accomplishment as president that you think will affect our next 100 years? <laughs> well, you want me to start off again? Sure. 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 Has the pattern been set? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that, but you can be okay. the go-to guy. Well, I'll just take a whack at it. Um, I think, and this uh, piggybacks a little bit on what Sam was saying, uh, I think that the, la- the greatest contribution, to my mind, uh, NCA has made has been to encourage um, what I would call, again, scholarly respectability. S- Sam said sophistication. I think those things go together. Uh, of our research, uh, I think somehow that the work we do now is a little more accepted or a little more settled into the, into the network of um, American scholarship. Maybe I'm being optimistic, but that's what I think. I think that the um, that uh, that when this association, at least for me personally, uh, was able to be accepted in the American yeah. Council of Learned Societies, that I thought was a fantastic moment and a, a kind of a dream moment. And I had nothing to do with it, <laughs> but I was certainly delighted when it happened. And I think that was a great uh, breakthrough moment. Yeah. As to my own. Uh, accomplishments such as they were. Uh, I was a leader in a time of transition. Uh, Bill Work was uh, retiring as executive director. I had the job of uh, chairing the administrative committee when uh, we were uh, able to get Jim Jim Gaudino. I knew nothing about those kinds of problems. We had to get Bill settled humanely into retirement and get an effective new executive director. That was tough. but I was fortunate to have Bob Jeffrey uh, at my side, and Bob's uh, wisdom and leadership quietly in that he was so effective in so many ways, uh, quietly, and that was a good thing for me. Uh, the thing I take greatest pride in, and then I'll shut up here, I guess, is I think I had some impact on uh, the, the development of one thing we haven't talked about, and that's more emphasis on under, undergraduate yes, uh, scholarship mm-hmm. and education. Um, I made a point in my speech, you know, you make these presidential addresses, they're instantly forgotten, thank God, mm-hmm. for most of us. But one thing I did say was that I thought that the, um, the undergraduate honors uh, society initiatives that were springing up here and there around the country were things that we should encourage and that um, uh, undergraduate honors uh, uh, societies and fraternities and sororities or whatever we call them, these things should be encouraged and uh, the late Ted Clevenger uh, took that seriously. It's wonderful to be taken seriously by anybody but he took that seriously and began the institution of the undergraduate um, honors component to the Southern Convention. And I guess over the last 20 years, we've had several thousand young people yep. present at the Southern Convention. Many of them have become our colleagues. And I think Western has now picked up on Others, this, as I recall. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I look at all that and I think, gee, <laughs> maybe something I said, you know, made it a little difference. So I take, I take uh, considerable pleasure in thinking about that. I don't think I made a damn bit of difference in this. Um, (laughs) I don't think any uh, president can. The the ones that make the difference are those doing great scholarship and reporting it, sharing it, um, helping advance the field. 
The only real difference I made was to uh, get the date, the dates of, of our <laughs> annual convention changed. <laughs> we always used to meet yeah. during the uh, Christmas holidays, and uh, people with young families had to leave home when, uh, when their kids were out of school, and... Uh, often didn't get back home until after New Year's. Uh, and the, uh, the older members of the organization who didn't have young children fought that they, because we were breaking with tradition. We'd always met during the Christmas holiday and, uh, and we shouldn't change that. Speaking of tradition, I want to go back to... Uh, Isis point, I'm, I'm slow thinking of things. Um, on a program, you never would have seen any of the presenters, any of the male presenters, like the two of us, not wearing a tie. It's wardrobe is too. Um, and uh, I think that's one of the great advantages so. of, uh, of retirement. You never have to wear a tie again. The depth is step back. I want to answer the question, and I'm going to invoke Osborne's presidency in doing this <coughs> greatest contribution, I guess. I'm supposed to say the name change and getting that through uh, the executive committee, and then Gardino and I would watch uh, straw votes, and we figured out when to send out the ballot. There was nothing very democratic about our process. <laughs> But we thought we hit it at just the right mark and sent it out. But actually, when I was uh, chairing pub board, I really thought that made the biggest difference. And I'll tell you why. Because we started to acquire journals. I really made it a job. And Michael was president at the time and not always happy with me. I got Performance Studies Journal. We bought that. I got Applied Com. We got that, and it started to set the tone that where our attention should be was on collecting and dis disseminating scholarship. I love that. And the one disappointing moment I had with Michael, Gerbner, George Gerbner, had offered me Journal of Communication for a buck. George was trying to get rid of it. And I said, yes. And I actually gave George the, the dollar right there. <laughs> but then I had to go chat with Michael about that. And Michael looked at me and said, Chesbro, you've done two journals in three years. That's really enough. Back off this one. We don't want to try to get this through. Otherwise, we'd have Journal of Communication, too. But the additions that we have, we said, let's uh, take critical studies and give it two more issues. Let's create cultural critical and create that journal as well. We we're on the road to saying we are professional, we publish scholarship, and that's our major activity. We'll keep, we'll keep moving in a linear way, which tells you we're, we really are old-fashioned, <laughs> given some of the research. Um, I, my answer to what are the contributions that have been NCA has made in the last 40 years, very much what you've heard earlier in terms of the diversification, the emphasis on scholarship, and now hearing about the undergraduates. Um, if, if someone had said to me, when you're president, your major contributions are going to be technology, I would have said, I'm not running. Um, but that's almost what happened. Um, I was, it's such a fortunate position to be the person who initiated all academic. And um, it was, fought, it was uh, rejected by the two presidents ahead of me because they were smarter than, than I obviously was, had no idea that this was not uh, software that had been tried and, and tested and spent, uh, actually moved in to the NCA office for uh, two months, lived in the carriage house, and three in the morning, many of you may have gotten emails from me saying, uh, all academic has just lost your program, and it began with the word, the. That's a true story. So uh, it was pretty awful. Uh, but someone had to do it, and I think sometimes a president be it, the name, it was time for the name change. It was time to involve undergraduates. It was time to do those things. And so when you become president, very often you are left with or given something you had no idea was going to show up, and it's your job to actually to be the leader who makes the decision. And I think that's a, a I look at 
Judy Tran and the work she did in intercultural. I think of Judy Pearson who took on creating a job fair rather than that crazy wacko uh, job center we used to have, that sometimes you just have to make that decision. And I think the contributions of all our presidents, when we push them, will find that they made some critical decisions that didn't really happen until we'd reach critical mass on them. So the gifts program, uh, supporting the grad schools, the summer programs. So I, what, what, what did I do as a president? I, I worked with the best executive committee that ever existed because I had folks like David Zareski and Scott Poole and, and Betsy working with me to make those decisions, and I think that's all the difference. One final contribution was I, my husband was on a – elevator when I was running for president and two of the older members of the association said, my God, if we vote for Engelberg, there'll be two women presidents in a row. (laughs) And it turned out there were three, and there are three again. And uh, those are the kinds of changes we can point to with pride uh, to to, uh, make the kind of critical mass change that happened not that long ago. This question actually has three parts. Of course. <laughs> the first part is what are, what are the major contributions NCA has made over the past 40 years? And I, I think there are two. One was already alluded to, and that is it's nurturing the intellectual maturation of the discipline. And the other, I think, is it has become a much more effective advocate for the discipline in a variety of settings ranging from public policy to working with departments and programs on individual campuses that are undergoing review and evaluation. Second part of the question is, what was your biggest accomplishment as president? And I preface this by agreeing very much with Sam that I don't think any one person has any great administrative accomplishment. Uh, I was uh, very privileged to serve as president at an exciting time uh, in the organization. Uh, I did a number of things. I I, I think if I had to identify what was most important out of what I did, it was during my year as president that the association undertook its very first strategic plan, uh, primitive by later standards, but an attempt to set priorities and directions. Uh, I initiated a practice, which I sometimes regretted, and I suspect many of my successors have regretted, of a president's column in spectra. Uh, I'm the one, uh, because I thought it was important to have a regular interchange uh, with the membership from the president's point of view about things that were going on in the discipline or, uh, or in the association. And as a related matter, I uh, used the presidential address as a bully pulpit to speak not to matters internal to the association, but to a larger set of social issues uh, with which the association was involved. Now, the third part of the question is, how will that affect our next 100 years? I doubt it will at all. <laughs> Can I just add something that David reminded me of? Um, and, and David actually was the person, well, while I was serving as vice president, president, who helped make this happen. It was during that period when our journals became, uh, we moved our journals over to Rutledge and Taylor Francis, and that negotiation was some of the most interesting interactions I've ever seen, and the fact that we then put all the journals online, so you can go back to 1923 or 46 or 18 and find the article you're looking for. Um, And I think that, too, was not a president, but a group of officers who saw that we'd reached a point where that decision had to be made. And David, as chair of the pub board at that point, uh, became very much part of those incredible and wise negotiations which have proved incredibly productive. So you weren't president, but man, we got you back to be well, pub chair. Do it for us. I mean, I've, I've been privileged to serve in a number of leadership positions. And I, I mean, I think, frankly, if I had any impact, I had more as chair of the finance board and chair of the publications <laughs> right, board right. Uh, at two different times right. than I did as president. What, what several of these people have said is that during the one year of the presidency or even the three years that you're in the chain, that uh, one person does not make that much difference. It's what one person does with other people or not that uh, does or does not make the change. And 
we in communication certainly ought to know that, but I would like to tie that to a change that has occurred in the organization and therefore is reflected in the discipline. And that is, as we permitted more voices to be heard, we got not only more diverse but better scholarship. We didn't just study the speaker as an individual or the leader as a person, but we began to look at movements and at, at groups and at a whole variety of things, and maybe that would have occurred without the diversification of the organization, and by that I mean by letting those voices be heard and that was part of the struggle that, can, that probably, it, it's certainly not reflected so much in this program, but David alluded to the point that in the early days there was a very limited number of programs that could be had, that could be on the program, and therefore there was competition among those people who were in charge, and if you let these other voices in, you either had to shut those guys up or you had to have more programs. And inevitably, we got the arguments. I can tell you the year I programmed, and that's number of years ago, belies my youth. Uh, the year I programmed, I said I will program to the extent of the rooms available in the convention, and you cannot believe how many people thought that we were absolutely headed to pure pap we were going to lose the quality of the scholarship because it was increasing in number, and therefore it couldn't possibly be as good. Well, I think the history has shown, as we have increased in number, it has also gotten better, and I will locate a good part of that cause in the listening to more voices. Now, what role did I play in that? I think by being there. What many of you probably don't know is that I was not nominated by any of the powers that be in the organization. Uh, uh, the nominating committee, in fact, expressly did not want me running the year that I had the temerity to self-nominate and to suggest that there were certain people that I would not run against. And uh, the fact that I, I ran anyway thanks to the wisdom I always have said of three guys named Bob, one of whom was Bob Jeffrey, uh, that uh, we took on the establishment and I was elected. And that, that would show, I was elected incidentally as a member of a community college faculty. So I was not at the university at the time that I was elected. Uh, and I broke the mold of a woman every 10 years. It, had, it was only, I think, two, de two years between Jane Blankenship and me. And then we started this business to when we finally reached the point where there was a woman succeeding a woman and then another one. And then, of course, the or association really was going to you-know-where in a handcart. Uh, the one thing I will say, though, that I think I had a small piece and it was, I won't say I, it changed anything because we, it's still an issue, is that I did appoint the committee that created an affirmative action policy for the association. And uh, we came back a few years later after another committee had uh, sort of uh, gutted the policy, and James Chesro appointed me to chair a committee to, uh, to revise it and get it back to some semblance of a, of a policy that we could be proud of. Let me add a note about Anita at that point. I was president, and I asked Anita to chair as, uh, the revision of the Affirmative Action Committee, and I thought, who would be good committee members for her? I decided no one. And Anita did it completely oh, no, on I her didn't. own. She no, wrote no, the no. whole thing, submitted no, it, no, no. carried it all the way through, <laughs> argued it every step of the way. You really did admit that. That really was one of her major contributions. <laughs> and she did it by herself. I was impressed beyond uh, well, I, her energy. Well, I did argue it a sole arguer, but I certainly did not develop that policy. There are people sitting in this room who worked with me in developing it. And we must remember, that was a revision of a revision. <laughs> so it was not a revision of the original policy. Oh, thank you all. We now have one final question that 
I'm very intrigued to hear your answers to this question. What changes do you think we will see as NCA continues as a vital organization into the next 100 years? Uh, I'm pretty sure I won't be here. <laughs> but since I'm gifted with uh, prophecy, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think that we, what we've said is we think we've strengthened our position over the last 50 years, that we are a stronger organization. But we have problems, obviously, that have been mentioned. But um, well, personally, at least over the next 50 years, which is, uh, God knows I hardly see that far, uh, I would sort of uh, like to see this organization now become more of a significant force politically. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean in a partisan sense. I mean in a larger sense. We've talked a lot about about the role of women has now, uh, you know, been established. It's non-existent. <laughs> now it's been established in the organization. But how about the how about the how about the plight of women across this globe? I mean, there there are women in societies who are systematically and profoundly abused by the ways in which they live. What about communication in terms of changing their fate or at least intervening in some way. Why can't NCA become a leader in promulgating values we say we believe in in our, in our credo? Let's make them instrumental values in terms of uh, global impact. Uh, I, I think I, I just mentioned women, but there are many, or many important areas even beyond that. And the fate of freedom of expression over the next 50 years. Why can't this become a more profoundly activist organization in terms of values that we say we believe? My word. Uh, building a little um, on what my colleagues on the far right had to say about the uh, <laughs> increasing role of, uh, <laughs> not politically, oh. right, uh, physically. Um, the role of women is, is going to be, and the leadership by women in our organization is going to become much greater. As they, as they are doing on college campuses, uh, in the, I can't remember, the 60s or 70s, this is just a small example of, of why that's going to happen. In the 60s or 70s, uh, Sandy Boyd, who was our president at that time, uh, decreed that no organization on our campus could discriminate uh, on the basis of gender anymore. Uh, that uh, every organization had to be open to both men and women. And at that time, we had two student leadership honoraries, a mortar board for women and... Um, Yeah, we had God, I can't, I can't, remember, can't, the, the, I can't uh, remember it either. The name was the one for men, even though I was a faculty was advisor key? at one time. Um, what the hell was it? I, I, I can't remember. Anyway, yeah, um, so the uh, mortar board could not continue to uh, only admit uh, women. And... Uh, The organ uh, uh, with people's names the same way, um, but but it could not restrict its membership to men. Today, both of those organizations are almost completely women, uh, because as as you know from some of the studies that have been done. Um, 
women are doing much better in college than men are uh, on average. Um, there are more of them proportionately coming to college um, and uh, doing better academically and taking over the leadership roles. And that's slowly moving up to our graduate programs where uh, uh, because there are more women with uh, good academic records, uh, we're getting more of them in, in our graduate programs. We've come a long way since my first department head, uh, E.C. Maybe, would not admit many women to our graduate programs uh, and would not give them stipends because he said, well, you know, they're going to get married and sure. drop great. out and all that money's wasted. And, uh, have babies. That sure changed, too. <laughs> so that's going to affect this organization. Uh, I want to first comment on this past, present, future construct we're using, especially as we hit the 100th anniversary. We use this at Eastern Communication Association. Mm -hmm. We just hit our 100th last year. And I was archivist and on the committee, and we were using this 100 years ago, next 100 years. Man, it did not work as a construct. Uh, let me give you a little idea. Like if you go back 75 years ago, we were lamenting the loss of oratory and the power of oratory. If you go back 50 years, we're worried that speech science and theater are really going to destroy us by leaving us. Those frames of reference just really didn't carry on and influence us much in the next 50 years. I do think the last 25 years starts to count a lot. Like when I did the ECA 100th anniversary volume, I looked at Benson's that he had done 70 for the 75th, and there was tremendous power and insight from that framework. But so I'm really a little cautious about using this 100 years ago. At best, I think we've got a history that's relevant that's 25 years ago. Maybe I'm in anti-intellectual in that regard, but I really find that's useful. In terms of the future, I also have the same kind of framework. I think if you try making a 100-year projection, you have no idea what you're talking about, and you, it's really a groundless kind of speculation. In the next 25 years, I think some very important things will happen, and I hope will happen to this association. Um, and particularly, I hope the association becomes much more strongly involved in digital communication technologies. I think digital natives are going to be coming into this association. We have 317 million people on Facebook now. That is where the preponderance of interpersonal communication occurs. Maybe you don't want that to be true. It is true, right? And every two hours on Internet means we reduce face-to-face -face time one hour. That's a fact, and that's what's happening. I hope we can embrace that at the 100th anniversary and suggest and signal this association knows that technology will enhance and work for communication. I'd like to see us branding ourselves more clearly in that direction. That really, I know, crosses a lot of people. It really means media determinism and all sorts of other things from a more scholarly standpoint. But I'm convinced that's where the world is going and I hope we can just cut and lead a little bit in this regard in terms of communication studies, not just follow. I think NCA as a professional association may need to look at some different kinds of functions. Uh, a few weeks ago, I went to the Maryland Communication Association meeting, and <coughs> someone from NCA office was there, and it was very well attended. But the interesting question was, how many of you belong to NCA? Out of about 60 people, which is very good for a Maryland Communication Association, about five or six raised their hands. Now, why aren't you a member? The answers were, what, are, what do I get for my money? 
And I, I, I don't mean that to be a crass question. It was an honest question. If you don't go to a lot of the conventions, if you are not pu publishing or doing research or mainly teaching, the journals don't speak to them because they were primarily college teachers. There weren't any high school, maybe one high school teacher in the group. And that was just a profound question for me. What do they get? Well, part of it is they don't know what NCA offers. It's not just the journals. And it's, yes, the convention is fabulous, terrific. They should go. But they don't get money, they say, but neither do I. Um, but things like communication currents, they don't know what it is. Uh, the, the speech teacher activities, they don't know about that. The website um, instructional communication and communication education sections, they don't know about that. The ethics credo, the definition of communication, they don't know about that. And I think maybe if for us to be, still be a viable Association, there needs to be ways not just to get, and I, I agree with what's been said, to promote communication studies to a larger community, public, media, other academic disciplines, but also to promote it within our own discipline and demonstrate why belonging to a professional association has enormous benefits both ways. And I, I just found that moment uh, pretty sobering, and I think that's to be viable, I think we need to reach into our own departments and help them as well as reaching out beyond our discipline to promote the discipline itself. Um, and I'll stop there because we'll probably comment on each other, but that was just a moment where I kept wondering where will we be if fewer and fewer people choose to belong to the National Association. As some of you know, I have no problem studying things that took place a hundred or more years ago. <laughs> but I normally don't project more than about five minutes out, much less five years or a hundred. So rather than predicting what's going to happen, what I would like to do is to identify three what I think are large issues that the association needs to address in the short run, in the next few years, and I think the way that they are addressed will affect the kind of organization that it is over a much longer term. One goes back to a comment that Mike Osborne made early on, and that's the reality or at least perception of declining commitment on the part of the association uh, to rhetoric and the humanities, which have been the traditional roots of, of the discipline. Uh, these are areas of study that are not disappearing. They're actually growing but they're not necessarily growing within this discipline. Mm -hmm. English, which cast them off, which gave rise to our beginning, has a hundred or so years later realized its mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, these are, are thriving areas of study increasingly in English and philosophy and classics and a variety of disciplines across the humanities. And one of the things that NCA as an association needs to decide is what is the place of these scholarly domains within NCA. And how that question is answered uh, will, among other things, uh, help to influence whether we remain as an association as our field is, uh, that is, representing the humanities and the social sciences, the uh, professions and uh, both basic and applied areas, whether it will be this umbrella for the entire discipline or not. That's number one. Uh, second issue I want to pose relates to something that Jim Chesbro said earlier, and that's the way in which we have grown. As I said, it has both costs and benefits. The benefits we have talked about uh, to some degree. Uh, the major cost that I see uh, is that there is, I believe, an increasing tension between the whole and the parts. That NCA becomes a holding company for a variety of individual constituencies with individual agendas. And the downside of that is that it becomes increasingly difficult for NCA to speak for the discipline as a whole or for the profession as a whole. At a time when I think we would all acknowledge the need for strong and vigorous advocacy on behalf of the discipline and on behalf of the, of the profession. And 
Obviously, the way to solve that is not going to be to eliminate all our divisions or to return to the way it was when we all joined the association, nor do I think any of us would want that. But to deny that there is an issue posed by the tension between the whole and the parts, I think will lead us down a road in the future that will weaken the association to acknowledge and deal in a constructive and forceful way with that tension, uh, I think will strengthen us. And the final thing I want to say relates to something that ISA just mentioned, and that is the generation that we are now referring to as digital natives and those who follow them, it appears, have some very different attitudes about associations, about memberships, about identification with societies and uh, and, and other groups. Uh, and it's, it's not entirely a what do I get for my money uh, emphasis, but it is, it is in part that. Uh, one of the less publicized facts about our association is we have a very high attrition rate, which means that every year we're recruiting lots of new members and members come in and out uh, as it suits their particular professional need or personal need. And there's nothing wrong with that except that, again, it weakens the association as an, a source of identity for the discipline and as a voice for the discipline. Part of this, I think, is, uh, uh, that has to be addressed is dealing with what ISA has mentioned, other services that we provide, other needs that we can meet, other functions that we serve. And part of it is, is addressing fairly openly the question, why is it important that we have strong professional associations whether or not at any given moment we are individually and personally benefiting from them. I was often asked, as I suspect many of the others on the panel were, why in the world would you consider seeking a leadership position within this association or with, with any other association? And the answer that I always had was the infrastructure of a discipline or a profession is not self-executing. We need it to be there for us when we need it. And if it's going to be there for us when we need it, we have to invest in it to make sure it continues strong because we never know when we're going to need it. We need to uh, do what Lauren Reed did to us in the uh, introduction to graduate study class we all had to take at the University of Missouri, and that is to uh, teach us all how to be professionals. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of that is the role in the association. I liked your summary, David. I thought I, I think you said very well the things that I would totally agree with, except I would repeat the point that uh, democracy is a messy process, and we need to continually struggle to answer the questions that you pose, but we have to simply recognize it is a fact of life when you have a whole variety of disparate voices that will be a constant struggle. It is no different in our nation than it is from in this association. Um, I was really puzzled by how this question was first posed to us, and Betsy, you opened it up for us a little bit because you said cut, what, what would you like for us to see, well, how would we like for it to be down the road instead of what we think it's going to be because I, too, have absolutely no idea what it will be like even five years from now. When I think of the changes in life over even just one decade that, I, that we have all lived through, uh, it, it's impossible to even imagine. What I would like for us to do are two things. I mean, I'd like for a lot of things to happen, but I will limit my comments to two things. One is that I would like for us to do a whole lot more attention to communication as it occurs in the digital world. That is, I don't particularly like it, but that is what I see in the future as a major, not the major, not the only one, but a major kind of communication, and I don't think we know much about it, and I'm not seeing us do much, much significant study of not the technology, but the communication and how people do it and how they relate to it and what are the impacts of it. Instead of just bemoaning the fact that they spend all this time doing their interpersonal communication electronically rather than face-to-face, -face, we need to know more about what's going on. Now, maybe that just suggests that I haven't been reading the appropriate scholarship, and if so, that's good. I'm happy that that's the case. 
I will move to where I know I have been reading the appropriate scholarship and say what I would like to see in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. We are seeing a, we have seen in the years that I've, since I've been president, we have seen a, a, a major change in the faces that we see in the leadership and on the programs and in the journals in our association. What we have not done is to see a change in the values attached to feminine and masculine. And until we have reached that, we will not have reached gender liberation, if you will, until it is okay for men and women alike to be feminine as well as to, for women to be in roles that men have done for years and to do those roles as well as men have done and to tweak them a little bit so that they're a little different when women do them until we make it as valuable to have the feminine values displayed as to display the masculine values, we will not have achieved true gender liberation. And I think the same point goes for the other kinds of opening up that need to occur. We have not really dented our our affinity for hierarchy. And as long as we maintain an affinity for hierarchy, there will be the ones on top and the ones who aren't. And the faces of the people on top may change, but until the role of hierarchy is changed, we will not have achieved the kind of community that I would like for us to have. And boy, if we think our current democracy is messy, wait until we have that one. But I was asked to say what I would like to see It's a messy world, but it is the kind of thing that I think offers true gender freedom to women and men, to people of all kinds of colors, of sexual orientations, of sexual manifestations, and a whole variety of other things. Well, I think what we've seen during the last hour or so is that our presidents have continually responded to the needs of our membership. And for about the next 10 minutes or so, I'm sure they would be willing, uh, since many of them did have that debate and forensic experience and have gone through cross-examination, I'm sure they would be willing to uh, respond to some of your questions. For those of you in the back, the question was on the role of teaching in our organization. I worry about that, too. Um, There have been a couple of movements within NCA to create a a splinter group called Truly Communication Education, not Instructional Communication, that studies, uh, promulgates, promotes, provides models of teaching and helping folks who are in teaching. I know one of the, my fondest homes is the community college section because so much of what we do is devoted to teaching. Of course, we're speaking to each other, but we are teaching 50% of all the undergraduates taking communication courses in the U.S. So so I think that's, um, on the other hand, we've had some very strong educational policy board groups in the last few years. Unfortunately, 
those who need those resources the most, A, don't know they're there, and it's the what am I getting for my money issue. Um, so you would hope that within every department there's someone who can say, you can get it through me. But it's, you're right, and it, it's, uh, it also extends in looking to those who write textbooks. And it's very difficult today to figure out how to help the adjunct or the new graduate or the teacher who hasn't read a journal in 30 years um, to show them where the discipline is. It's a huge issue. Fortunately, I think we are doing, NCA is doing more. I just wish more people knew what we were doing. Thank you for that. Anybody else wish to comment on that? Okay, we'll move to another question. The question is, are guiding principles, which ones should we look to as we plan for and try to anticipate the future? Every voice counts. Every voice should be heard. We have some in our mm -hmm. credos, freedom of speech, ethics. We do have some standards for undergraduate education that I think are grounded in, prin in, in principles related to uh, defining the 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 discipline itself. Um, I sometimes think national organizations, as, as David suggested, are so diverse, it's very hard to take a stand on a particular position or principle. Um, I just came out of a session where they said, do you have any standards for what constitutes excellent communication research? You meaning NCA. Yeah, look at our journals. No, no, no. When I have to go up for tenure and I have to show them what excellence is, you, ha you show me no way. So what is this great, what are the principles or at least what are the characteristics of excellent research? And I don't know if that's a principle, but we have some, but I think that's a great question. I want to add think. to that if I can. Um, first of all, using, I really think Anita said it in so many ways, that was the most profound statement we, I've heard at this panel, but I would want to add one other thing, the importance of trying to chat across the division sections, regional groups, affiliated groups, all of the, the mess that we have in NCA and figuring out a way of doing that. I often think is there an analogy, some way we've actually done it that we really felt worked. And I remember very vividly, and Mal actually chaired the first of this, but when the Black Caucus, Women's Caucus, and Gay Lesbian Caucus met together and chatted, interacted, did joint programs. And Mal, you remember, you actually formalized this, remember, uh, when you were, I think, chairing something like the Inner Caucus Board or whatever it was called, something like that. And that really was an enriching, you started to see differences across traditional lines, and we could really communicate together. If we could do that cross-sectional analysis across the whole association, moving us towards community of scholars more, where we really care about other areas. And we <clears throat> part of this is just specialization has overtaken the academy so profoundly, and we need to counteract that somehow and find the links among differences. I, I would endorse completely Anita's formulation and I would add to it that in the long run, more communication is better communication, that the issues that we confront are difficult enough that nobody's voice should be left out, and that while events may influence what we do, they don't determine what we do. Mike? I'm not sure I quite know how to answer it, but I think that, that the, the, the direction of an answer begins with taking communication itself as a, as a kind of a terminal or inherently meaningful concept. What does it, why are we, I mean, why, why, what do we mean when we say national communication 
association. I think we need to fo- focus, not just that we have a credo, but, but what sometimes those, those are, that's just a collection of platitudes, you know? But what does it really mean to human development to communicate? What does it mean historically? What does it mean in terms of the emergence of our species, for God's sake, that we communicate? And I think that I think that I think the inquiry first has to go there, and that that everything we develop as a set of values, things worth promulgating, things worth developing in the world, begins generated out of that inquiry. And I, I think that's that's the first step. I don't know if it makes any sense or not, but it's a great question. We've got time for one more question, Star. <clears throat> So our question, boiled down, is <laughs> respond to the distinction between fragmentation and diversity. <laughs> and nobody wants to tackle that's that one. Excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> nobody wants to silence. I, oh, I, we need I, I'm not sure I see those two things in tension. I see those two things as as related, but what gets in tension in what what I see the tension is is between diversity and fragmentation on the one hand, and and as David and others have pointed out, the the search for some kind of center to go back thirty years when we were talking about exactly the same thing. Um, the 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 tension is. How do you have the fragmentation and diversity and maintain some whole? 
And as I said, I think David said that. If I understand the question, I think that what I would describe as the fragmentation within NCA has little to do with diversity as we commonly use that term. Uh, I think that the growing diversity of the association is an unquestioned good. I think the fragmentation is largely about game playing the system for getting convention programs accepted by creating additional divisions and units out of the same subject matter areas. I'm not talking about the additions that have resulted from deliberate decisions to broaden the membership and to broaden the involvement of people in, in the association. So at least as I understand the question, I see them as two completely different things. Well, on that note, I want to certainly thank our panelists for uh, <laughs> reflecting for us today. One quick note, you heard num a number of them make reference to the whole notion of technology, and this panel has obviously proven to be much more than just a nostalgic look back at the presidency of six individuals or seven individuals in our organization. But I think it's provided a lot of food for thought. It is being videotaped, and that will be on the NCA uh, website. There will be podcasts available so that as people continue to uh, have this debate, about where the association should go, what we can possibly do. The comments today can continually be uh, gone back to and reflected upon. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.